And um, my uh, privilege uh, and honor tonight is really just to say welcome and thank you. Uh, just want to express a, a tremendous amount of gratitude and appreciation uh, for the coalition's uh, community council. Really great to see you, Lawrence, and appreciate your leadership on the community council uh, and the board of directors, uh, as well as the staff members, uh, and really, very most importantly, the members. Uh, the, the coalition is a membership organization. Uh, and uh, the members, both the organizations and those who join as individuals are extremely uh, important for us, as well as any guests who are here on this evening. Um, and uh, I'm encouraged by the progress that we have made on this uh, very difficult, intractable issue of gun violence uh, across the Commonwealth. Um, and I'm encouraged by all of you uh, and the work ahead is immense and daunting. Uh, so uh, any hope that we have, we have it only together. And great appreciation uh, to you, uh, Nyoka, for joining us on this evening for the research you've done, uh, for the exposure that it has received uh, in the Boston Globe. Um, and uh, your being with us will help us to, to take it and do something uh, with it. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for your work. Thank you for joining us. And again, much appreciation to everyone. Uh, and with that, let me turn it back over to you, Ruth. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for um, setting the tone and the spirit for this evening. It is really great to be with everyone tonight. Thanks for spending time on this beautiful fall evening with us. We are very excited to learn more about Naoka Carey's research. We'll talk more about that in a bit. We also have some announcements and updates and exciting things to share with you. So our agenda for this evening is we're gonna start with some of those announcements, tell you a little bit about what's been going on since we last were in this space together, focus on the research that Naoka has been doing and will share with us. And then we'll speak at the end around what we are looking ahead to. So that is our basic agenda for this evening. Hopefully you'll be able to stick around. We are also recording this as you have seen uh, and we'll be sending out the recording afterwards and you can feel free to share it with others if there are folks that you think might be interested in the content who are not able to be with us tonight. So getting into our announcements. Um, first, something that we at, are hard at work on right now, I think Folks are aware that each year we host an event called the Peace MVP Awards. Uh, every year we celebrate the work of the coalition and we also celebrate the work of an activist who has moved mountains to address the issue of gun violence. And I am excited to be looking at our Peace MVP honoree from last year and our board vice president, Cindy Diggs, uh, who is joining us this evening. Uh, and this year we will be honoring coach Dennis G. Wilson, who is known to me and many others just as coach. If you are not familiar with him, coach has been an inspiration to young people in the Boston community for many years through his work at Madison Park High School. He was a teacher there for many years. He has coached basketball there for many years. He is also one of the founders of what was the Roxbury Raiders football program, now called the Boston Raiders football program. And he is the co-producer of a movie, a documentary called This Ain't Normal, which looks at youth violence as well as the frontline workers who day in and day out show up for young people. This Ain't Normal has been something the coalition has been partnering uh, with the documentarians on to host screenings and panel discussions, which is how we got to know Coach but we are very excited to honor him. The event will be happening on Monday, October 24th at 7 p.m. It will be at the Cathedral of St. Paul on the Common. There will also be a virtual option. I see Emily is putting in the links and information if you're interested in signing up. I'm also super excited to announce that we will have a live musical performance that night with Lisa Bello, who many folks might know. Um, Lisa is an amazing musician. She is also a former Boston schools teacher who knows coach. So the connections are really kind of fun. So it's gonna be an evening of celebration and music and we're super excited about it. 
So we wanted to invite all of you to join us that evening. We are also interested in finding opportunities to let people know about Peace MVP. If you know of local businesses that might be interested in participating as sponsors, please let us know. Uh, we're really trying to build our community, our coalition community, and bring folks into this amazing event to help us celebrate. So uh, please be in touch if you have thoughts about who else we should be reaching out to. Uh, so that's Peace MVP. So, and we are sending out lots of emails about it. And you can also catch that information on our social media if you've not seen it. Totally switching gears. One of the other pieces of work that the coalition was very involved with over the past several months was advocating for an allocation for the American Rescue Plan for violence prevention. And we brought together a lot of folks, both from the coalition as well as national partners and other people across the Commonwealth to advocate for this funding. And I am very pleased to say that we were successful at securing a $50 million allocation for gun violence prevention, youth jobs, and reentry services. This bill was actually passed several months ago, but I mention it now because one of the things that we talk about a great deal and um, Lauren Stevenson on our screen is someone who's really brought this home is the importance of not just getting something passed or getting an allocation, but really um, looking at the implementation and seeing this through so that the practice and the implementation really sticks to those core values of why we wanted to get the allocation or the bill passed. And we are continuing to do work with the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, which is where this money has landed to um, really be present with them and thinking about how this money will be allocated, what a competitive grant program will be like. And so if you are with a member organization, or if you're doing violence prevention work and you're interested in learning more about where this funding stands, feel free to get in touch with us. We can let you know what the status is and also make sure that you get information once the request for proposals and once these pieces move forward so that you can be in the mix of applying for this money. Um, of note, in terms of gun violence prevention money, in the recent economic bill that was taken up at the end of the last legislative session, unfortunately it didn't pass because there were some issues with the tax rebate piece, but in that economic bill were a number of spending items, including an additional 15 to $17 million for gun violence prevention. We are still hoping that the legislators will take up this bill, not just in terms of the tax rebates, but also the spending pieces so that we can get even more dollars for community-based violence prevention and intervention programs through the economic bill. So we will keep folks posted as this develops, but hopefully there will be even more resources available for people doing this meaningful work in community. Uh, as you know, one of the coalition's priorities is making sure that we're strengthening our legislation, passing new legislation, but there are also engaged and sustained investment in community-based solutions, as well as the communities most impacted by gun violence. So we're hoping to see this additional funding pass as well. I am now gonna pass it over to our president emerita, Janet Goldenberg, who will talk about some of the other work that we were involved in since we last saw you all, Janet. Thanks, Ruth. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone tonight. It's been a while. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about um, some post Bruin legislation. And just to give everyone some grounding background there, um, last legislative session, the coalition was focused on a couple of bills, including crime gun data analysis and banning ghost guns. And it was all sort of sailing along until the Supreme Court threw a giant monkey wrench in the works. Uh, in the form of New York uh, Rifle and Pistol versus Bruin, which was a decision that said um, the state of New York or the city of New York could no longer uh, ask someone the reason they wanted to carry a gun and factor that reason into their licensing. Massachusetts had a similar position, provision in our law. Most chiefs didn't enforce it, some did. If that had been all the Bruin decision had been, it wouldn't have been such a big deal for us to no longer have that provision in our law. But the court went a little bit further and there was some language in the decision around what was permissible in licensing 
and whether it was permissible to have discretion. And they talked about states being may issue states and shall issue states and without getting too in the weeds, there was some language around whether it was okay to be a may issue state, which is what Massachusetts is. And rather than wait for that to be challenged and have a giant court battle, our legislature, I think, wisely decided to get out ahead of it and simply shore up our laws to make sure that we can continue having some of the best laws in the country rather than risk key provisions being overturned. So they decided they're gonna focus on how do we address Bruin. And there were a number of different versions of fixes floating around. And, and I just wanna say out loud to everyone here that. The difference between what happened now and what happened 10 years ago as the coalition was just forming and we were just beginning to address an omnibus gun bill, it was night and day. Because now we had legislative allies, we had built relationships thanks to all of the hard work that you all have been doing all along. And we were able to check in with folks in the AG's office, in the House, in the Senate, with the chiefs, across the board to get input, national allies, and to really weigh in on what was an effective way of addressing this. And I will tell you, there were some versions floating around that maybe might have been more problematic than helpful. And we were able through meetings, through advocacy, to help ensure that what the legislature actually passed was clear, helpful language that strengthens our laws, addresses what the court did in Bruin, and also added in. Um, some additional language to prohibit people with harassment orders against them from getting gun licenses, which was a huge uh, value add in addition to addressing Bruin. So uh, everyone here should really feel good about what we've built together. Um, but now it's time to get the court, to get the legislature to go back to what we're working on with ghost guns and crime gun and all of the rest, having addressed Bruin. But that was a key moment for the coalition. And so everyone here should just know that that this was a real value add that we were able to bring as being experts in this area for their legislators. Thank Anything so else you wanted to talk about? You're good, that's good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janet. It's really helpful to have all that perspective. And I think it's important for folks to know um, all that went into those discussions. And I also just wanna appreciate Janet's role in helping to make these conversations happen. Uh, as well as all the work that she and others have done in the state house to build our presence, to build our relationships, to give us the opportunity to be in conversations with the right people, to have the right influence so that the right decisions were made. Uh, there was a lot of work that happened at the end of the legislative session, but that was really built on many years of constant presence and advocacy. So I just want to appreciate the work that you have done, Janet, as well as so many others on the screen uh, to really make it that moment happen for us. Um, and we look forward to continuing this work. We'll be talking at the end of the program tonight about how we move forward with all of this amazing advocacy and relationships that we have built. So thank you for that. I am now going to turn it over to Emily Poppy, our communications and policy specialist. Emily. Thanks Ruth. Hey everyone. Um, so I'm really excited to announce that we have welcomed a new intern to join us for the fall semester. And so I hope you will all join us in welcoming uh, Stephanie Karos, our new intern. She is a master's student at the Boston University School of Public Health. Um, and she's been with us, I think, for about a week, and we're already so thrilled that she has joined us. Uh, and I put her on the spot. I don't think that she knew that I was going to do this. So apologies, Stephanie. Don't need to give a speech. Um, <laughs> but we are really excited to have you with us. Um, and in addition to that, I also want to acknowledge that September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, we know that more than half of all gun deaths are suicides. Um, and so it is really, really important that we continue to keep that in mind as we do this work. Um, we, we know that gun violence prevention laws that we've advocated for and we have in Massachusetts Save Lives, like safe storage and extreme risk protection orders, um, and for more information on that topic and resources, you can check out our website as well as some really great graphics on our social media that Stephanie has made for us already. Um, and as well as check out the work of some of our member organizations like Didi's Cry and the Arredondo Family Foundation for more information and to see the work that they're doing in this field. 
Thank you, Emily, and welcome, Stephanie. Uh, I also want to shout out another website that we worked on very hard with um, our friends at Stop Handgun Violence, it's specifically about extreme risk protection orders and the important role that they play in preventing firearm suicide. If you would like to learn more about extreme risk protection orders, which we refer to as ERPOs, the website is maerpo.org. And Emily always finishes my sentences for me by putting things in the chat at the exact right time. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, but that is a website that we worked on with our friends at Stop Handgun Violence to make sure that people could access the information that they needed to be able to learn about this tool and utilize it when they need to. Um, so all that information is there for you. So thank you for all those announcements, Emily and Janet, and thank you again, Mark, for our opening. Uh, now we're going to get into the heart of our program and welcome Naofa Carey. Um, we are going to start with just learning more about her research uh, and doing some prepared questions that she and I talked about so we can guide the conversation and then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we will try to get to all of them before our meeting is done. But first, I do want to introduce Nayoka so you can all learn a little bit about her and her work. Nayoka Carey is a senior advisor for the Columbia Justice Lab's Emerging Adult Justice Project. From 2009 through 2019, she worked at Citizens for Juvenile Justice, serving as CFJJ's executive director from July 2013 through December 2017. Nayoka has a JD from New York University School of Law and is completing doctoral work in applied developmental and educational psychology at Boston College, where she conducts research on the impact of state level policies and neighborhood contacts on adolescent development. Nayoka, welcome. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm just excited to get to talk more with all of you and answer any questions. Um, I was really excited when our research came out that it got press because it allowed me to sort of direct press out to people who are actually doing work and trying to address the underlying issues and really especially people who are trying to address root causes around gun violence. And so, um, and that is sort of, um, you know, we are hopeful that our research is a little piece of a puzzle that people put together and that it's helpful. Um, so, um, so to that end, I'd be really happy to answer questions or even concerns if, after the research is done. Um, so I'm gonna put in the chat a little, for if you're the kind of person, I'm gonna talk about the research, but if you're the kind of person who likes to look at pictures and graphs, um, there's a video abstract um, of the research that I'm gonna talk about. So I'll put it out there and people are welcome to take a look at that. It's a pretty short, well, in research world, it's a pretty short description. Um, so my research uh, that I'm talking about tonight is focused on adolescents carrying handguns. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of context for why we wanted to do a study about adolescent carriage. Um, so first of all, carriage is not the same as violence, but it's associated with all three kinds of injury that we see with guns. So it's associated with homicide and suicide and unintentional injuries. Uh, and we knew that in a lot of respects, those some of those harms were growing um, and that we didn't understand very much about patterns of carriage, particularly for a national sample. So a lot of handgun carriage research has been focused either on only urban areas or is based on research that was done with young people in the mid 90s. <laughs> and we know a lot of things have changed <laughs> since the mid 90s. And so we really wanted to get a handle on what was going on with adolescent handgun carriage now. So we used a big national data set that is collected um, by, it's called the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, but they also ask adolescents, they ask teenagers if they've carried a handgun in the last year. Um, and so that's one of the many questions that they ask them. And um, so what we looked at was whether the percentage of teenagers answering that question, yes, I've carried a handgun in the last year, 
had changed between 2002 and 2019, which was the last year that we had data for. And what we found overall was that there was a really big increase. So there was a 41% increase in the number of young people who reported that they were carrying a handgun. And, um, and what we did then was sort of look at, well, what's going on with different groups? Um, and the reason we were looking at some of these, a lot of those harms, those violence is associated with um, change, differences in neighborhood context and also differences in the culture or norms. And so, um, so we wanted to sort of explore how carriage might be related to where people were living or potentially their families, but we didn't have enough data. And we didn't have a lot of rich data about their neighborhood. So what we ended up doing was looking at some demographic differences um, that are associated with those things. Um, and so we looked at differences in rural versus urban contexts, and we looked at differences in um, for youth of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and we looked at differences for youth um, for gender and for income. And what we found was that the increase was going the fastest. So the fastest rate of increase was among rural youth, white youth, and the highest income youth. Um, and so what that meant was that the patterns of carriage had really changed between 2002 and 2019. Um, and I can get into that in a little bit more detail, but I wanted to just start with headlines and then we can kind of talk a little bit more. So Ruth, I wanna, before I just go off, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you jump in. Yeah, thanks for that overview, Nayoka. And I also just wanna remind folks that as you're having questions, please do put them in the chat and we will try to get to all of them at the end. I know for me, when I read the study, um, there were so many things that jumped out at me and they, it challenged my assumptions. It's not, there were things that surprised me, but I really am interested to hear from you, Nayoka, what most surprised you as you looked at the data and analyzed this? What were some of the things that really jumped out at you as being the most surprising or the most important for us to really consider? So I think, um, and I'll talk, kind of at the end about some of the assumptions that I think get challenged um, by the data and got challenged, I would say, for us as well. Um, but I think the biggest surprise for me was just how much the patterns had changed over time. And I think that's partly because in a lot of the research that's done on teen gun carriage, there is assumption made that it's just a given that Black youth are most likely to carry, that urban youth are most likely to carry, that that's where, that's who is, that's who carries guns. And that was not at all reflected in our data. So our data really showed that rural youth are much more likely and have been much more likely actually across the whole time span to carry guns. Um, and this is handguns, because I got a lot of pushback like, oh, they're hunting guns. That's what rural youth are doing is going out to hunt. And this is just handguns that we're talking about in this study. Um, so that was one thing. Um, the other thing that was, I think, surprising was for the highest income youth, and it's not a super high income group in this study, um, it's, it's people with family income over $75,000 a year, but they were the least likely to carry at the beginning of the study period and the most likely to carry when we're talking about the most recent time period, so 2015 to 19. Um, that was a big surprise for me and not something I expected to change. Like you expect, maybe you'll see a little bit of change, but not for things to flip. Um, and that was what we saw. Um, the other thing that we saw was very dramatic increases among white youth um, in carriage. And so I think both of those things, I think both challenge narratives that I think were racist to begin with and are often sort of racist in how they're perpetuated about who's carrying and who is risky when they carry. Um, and also, um, and we can talk about that because it's a very, like I think there's a bunch of complexity in that discussion. Um, but also I think um, for me, the sort of like the fact that white, we spend a lot of time surveilling and targeting the young people who were not most likely to carry in our study. Um, and to keep in mind that all carriage is illegal for all of these kids, they're all under 18. 
and and I come from a justice system background. And so I'm thinking, who's getting like, is there just no enforcement happening? Like, what's going on here? Why is this, you know, sort of why is this going up and nobody is talking about it? So that was sort of my my sort of, I think, surprise, but also, you know, trying to unpack what my own assumptions were going in. And I think it's, um, it also, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Naira. Oh, I, I just have a question about Trump. It predates Trump. <laughs> it continued under Trump, but it predates Trump. Um, so um, in, I, I actually was interested in like, did it correlate actually with Obama getting elected, not with Trump getting elected, but with a different kind of sort of um, response. But it, it had, it was sort of, it started growing quite quickly, at least in this time period that we studied. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we can talk about in a little bit, our data didn't include pandemic data. And so there's a bunch of questions we have about the sort of impact of the pandemic on what that might do to those trends. Yeah, and just the, the thing that I reflect on too is it's really hard to make good policy or good practice unless you fully understand an issue and have really looked at the data, the underlying issues. And so, you know, what you're talking about, and, we're, and we'll get to this in a bit, can really influence and should influence how we think about policy and practice when it comes to responding to youth gun carrying. Before we get at that, I just wanted to highlight again one of the statistics or one of the findings that you mentioned earlier because your study found that the number of young people ages 12, 12 to 17 who reported they carried a handgun in the prior year increased by 41%. I know you already said that, but I thought it was worth saying out loud again, because that is a huge jump. And that was in a, a 17 year period of time. It was not over 50 or 70 years. It was in a relatively short amount of time. So I know that your research didn't necessarily quantify this, but I'm wondering if uh, in the research that you were doing, if you had a sense of what some of the underlying issues could be, um, and then I also want to touch on the pandemic, even though this doesn't cover the pandemic, but if, if you could start with just any thoughts that you have around how we understand what's at play here. Sure. Um, so first I would say that other research that actually came out almost like within a month or so before our study came out actually found that, you know, handguns are now, or guns are now the leading cause of death for children in the United States. Um, and so the research on sort of carriage increasing in guns being the leading cause of death and sort of increasing over time and now being leading cause of death are, I think, consistent in terms of like, there is a, there are different risks associated with that. Um, I think I just want to stress too, that I suspect that carriage is being driven by different things in different contexts. <laughs> Um, and so I think it's really important to, and that's part of what our sort of big message from the study is, is that we can't assume gun carriage looks like one thing and it looks the same for all young people. We can't assume that things that were true in the 90s about guns are true today. Um, and that we know that to the extent we do effective gun violence prevention, it's tailored to the community and the root causes in the community. And so you want to make sure that you're sort of, this is a nice way of sort of calling attention to the fact that there are some trends that we maybe are not paying attention to, but it doesn't take away from the need to be community specific in your response and understand that it's possible there are different factors driving the increase for different young people. Um, so that's sort of a long way to get into what's going on, why are there big increases? So first of all, we know that there have been big increases in gun ownership during this time. Um, so a lot more people are purchasing guns and a lot more people have guns in their homes. Um, and that's, um, so that's one thing going on overall across the country in a lot of different places, but not equally in all places. Um, and that's because we have really different gun policies in different states. And um, that's some of what you all just talked about is like, how do we make Massachusetts a place um, that has very proactive gun violence prevention policies? Um, but you see very, very different policies. Um, and in some places you've seen um, 
less protective, like shifts away from more protective policies. Um, and there's definitely research showing that those, um, that the laws are related to the levels of carriage um, at the state level. Um, and actually the Boston Globe did a lovely job, um, the reporter for the Boston Globe of pulling out some of the state level data and showing that the trends in Massachusetts specifically didn't look like the trends in Maine and didn't look like the trends in New Hampshire. And without, I haven't done the research to directly to connect the dots with the policy, but my suspicion is that that's related to the overall policy landscape that you see in those different places around and how that affects trickles down to carriage. The other possible explanation is that, um, or one of many, is that, um, is that there are changing norms around gun carriage for children um, in certain communities. And that, um, you know, you certainly see um, anecdotally more people saying like, our whole family carries guns, we're gonna take pictures with our guns, right? And so in that context, you may see increases in carriage if there are changes in the norms around carriage and that could be in any of the settings. Um, I will say that the increases among white and the highest income youth happened across contexts. So it was not just rural white youth, it was white youth in rural areas and white youth in urban areas where the carriage was increasing. And it was um, highest income groups in rural areas and highest income groups in urban areas. So it wasn't, it's not just a white rural youth phenomenon, it's, it was across the board. Um, for those groups, for white youth in all settings and for highest income youth in all settings. Um, so that's sort of to put it out there. Um, I also think at least um, until recently, there were big reductions in violence in a lot of communities. And to the extent that your feeling of safety drives carriage, then if you have reductions in the levels of violence and in the levels of crime, then you would see, you would expect to see reductions in carriage among certain groups. Um, so that, again, like this is part of why I put a pin in the idea that we don't know what will happen because the pandemic has really disrupted a lot of, um, a lot of patterns. So, um, so that's what the consequences of that and what consequences of like increases in violence in a lot of communities will be for carriage. I don't know yet. Um, so that's, those are sort of some of the theories, I guess, those are some of our working theories, but we have to really do research. And that was our other agenda was to be like, do research on youth today, stop doing research on youth in the 90s, like do research on what's happening right now. Um, so, and I am, I, I could go on about like, I'm sympathetic to the researchers using this older data, but, and why they do it, but it's just not helpful. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think that really leads to the next question, although I also want to point out, I noticed too in that Globe article, the piece around how Massachusetts looks different. Um, and we see a lot of data about, and, and also some data that came out around rates of firearm suicide being much lower in states with strong gun laws yes. and fewer gun stores. So like we know that strong gun laws work. We know that gun laws save lives. And it was interesting to see in that Globe article that that information was really highlighted too. You've been, and actually I wanna pull out one of the questions from the chat just because I think it might inform the next part of the conversation. Was the increase relatively steady throughout that period of time or was there a certain moment in time where you saw a sharp increase? And, and can you speak to, if so, why that would be? Um, so initially, and so the way that we broke up our study is we sort of blocked together groups of, of years. So we have sort of 2002 to 2006 as our first group. And then there were a second group from 2007 to 2010, and then a 2011 through 14, and then 2015 to 19. And I say that because there was actually for a number of groups, there was a slight decline at the very beginning. Um, and then it seemed to go up very steadily. Um, and I don't know um, whether that's related to the larger political dynamic, whether it's related to increases in, you know, adult gun carriage that trickle down to children, um, if it's, or if there's, you know, something else going on, um, if the decreases were driven by one set of factors and the increases were driven by another set of factors, right? Like, 
it would be nice to start to tease all of those things apart. Um, the data was nice because it was national and I could look at rural versus urban context, which I really wanted to do, but, um, but it, it, they were terrible in terms of asking good detailed <laughs> questions about what's actually going on with people, so. And I think that that, we, you know, you spoke to the importance of looking at the here and now as opposed to relying on data that happened in the 90s. And of course, the here and now is the pandemic. And we know that gun sales skyrocketed during yes. the pandemic and particularly the height of the pandemic, rates of shootings also went way up. I know your research and doesn't- mental help. health crises went way, way up, right? So right. we see like in terms of the, you know, especially thinking about suicide prevention month, the, there was this double impact of a huge increase in gun sales and gun ownership and a huge increase in adolescent depression and suicidal right. ideation. So. Yeah, so let's hold the, the suicide um, prevention piece for a moment because I want to attend to that as its own topic. But are there questions that you have or want to see answered about how the pandemic would have affected some of the information you looked at? Yeah, I mean, I think we would love to really look more closely at the extent to which um, adult gun ownership is driving child carriage um, and that sort of like, and, and then if we could unpack that. So there are some people doing some really nice research on that only in rural settings because they have a, a study set up to look at it, but to think about whether those increases in guns get reflected in greater rates of carriage. And in terms of thinking about are, you know, if guns start in a sort of a legal purchase situation and then trickle out into all sorts of other kinds of carriage, if there is a link between sort of legal increases in gun ownership and other kinds of carriage, especially carriage for teenagers. Um, so that's one question I have. Um, I think the other question is whether, you know, sort of the neighbor, like more deeply getting into that neighborhood context and sort of the the underlying stressors that people were experiencing. There were just a huge number of economic stressors and mental health stressors and family stressors, like all of the things that are associated with um, both, you know, anxiety and depression and violence. And so um, thinking about whether we could sort of look at that and look at whether those things related to increases in carriage for kids would be helpful. Great. I want to touch on two other things and then get to all these great questions that are coming in the chat. But one thing that I pulled from the Globe article about your research, you note the following. It's really important for people to not assume they know what kind of kids carry guns. And that goes for pediatricians and public health workers. You need to be educating families and young people about the risks for carrying a gun, whether they come from a low income or high income family. And I was hoping that you could reflect on that and maybe talk a little bit more if there are any other, and you touched on this a bit before, but if there are any other policies or practices that you would want for folks to adopt or change based on the learning from your research, what would you want to see? Um, so definitely just to echo that this sort of not making assumptions, especially for primary care providers or other people who are in a position or emergency, you know, emergency room physicians or other people who are in a position to do, I guess what I would call culturally sensitive and thoughtful, like context informed sort of advising to people about the risks of carriage. Um, one of the studies that I became aware of when I started this research actually looked at how many parents believed they had safely locked up their gun versus how many of their teenagers reported that they could access the gun. And there was a real disconnect where parents were like, oh no, I've you know secured my gun, it's fine. And the teenager is like, I totally can get the gun. Um, and so I sort of, that can be true across all different groups of you know teenagers. And so making sure that families understand that they need to secure guns if they own them and, um, and that people need to be informed about the risks of gun carriage regardless of you know, what economic background or what stereotypes um, you know, people have about gun carriage. 
Um, so I think that was that was a big takeaway. I think the other thing is sort of again sort of stressing that you need to understand what's driving carriage within your own community, right? So like there are some wonderful interventions that were piloted with um, Alaskan native villages on securing guns that would work really well there, but might not work in suburban Houston. And so you really need to understand what your context is or it's not going to work. And I think that's hard for policymakers to hear when they have to make policy for very different contexts, but I still, but it's, great in terms of thinking about funding and making sure that you're funding a diverse range of approaches that make sense within the context that they're operating in. Great, thank you. Um, touching on one other thing, and then we're gonna get to some of the questions, many questions in the chat, is I did wanna go back to, and actually let me say it this way, when Naoka and I first met and to talk about this research and how we might do some work together, we talked a lot about the implications of this running parallel to a real crisis in this country when it comes to mental health. The fact that so many of our young people are struggling in the world and now we have so many more guns in circulation and we're learning about these trends in youth gun carrying. And I wanna talk about the issue of, of young people and firearm suicide um, and you know, just have a, conver a quick conversation about you know, what do we need to be thinking about with that I'm also seeing a question in the chat from Janet about um, whether there was an increase. I lost the question. Oh, it has youth suicide increased in those same areas or demographics. So Nick, I'm wondering if you can re reflect on what you learned about that piece and what you're thinking about as we move forward. Right, so we had um, one of the sort of initial um, findings that we had used when we were thinking about what our hypotheses were before we started, where there were increases in um, rural emergency rooms, both in terms of suicide and in terms of unintentional gun injuries. Um, so you were seeing increases in rural areas in injury um, of different kinds. Um, I didn't see research specific to income, um, but we had seen some research indicating that there were increases in carriage among white youth earlier than this study. Um, so an earlier study looking at it was noting that there were increases, but it was still, it was from a slightly earlier time period. So it was a little unclear whether that trend was continuing. Um, so that's that sort of, you do see some indicators of violence um, correlating directly with carriage. Um, but this is why I think earlier I was like, that's a really complicated story. I think some of the indicators of violence are less closely correlated with carriage. Um, suicide is quite like, there's a lot of research very consistently finding car that carriage or household um, ownership is, is correlated with suicide rates. Um, but the, um, but the, but with homicide, there are a lot of other factors going on at the same time. Great, thank you for that. Um, now to get to some of the questions that we saw in the chat, there were a couple of people who asked about marketing uh, and how guns are marketed. And it's interesting that this question is coming up because I was reading today about the families from Highland Park that are suing Smith and Wesson. And one of the things that they talked about was the incredibly scary marketing tactics that Smith and Wesson used, and really it's getting at that in this lawsuit. I know a lot of folks have been talking about that issue of marketing. So um, can you speak to whether you feel marketing has impacted these trends or in what ways? Um, I don't know is the short answer for these specific trends. I think it's a really good question. I think both marketing and an overall carriage are the are two things I'd like to look at in terms of like, are they are they driving and and are they affecting directly young people, right? Some of the arguments being made in court are that those they're really targeting, if not under 18s, they're targeting young men. Um, with those ads, um, or is it just driving carriage in adults, if for among adults, and then the adults either give or sort of act as straw purchases for their own children, right? Like they're giving them to their children. Great, thank you. Another question, and I'll read this because there was a lot to it. Do you think this is an issue that is moving into other communities or was it always present in all communities? 
similar to how we did not care when crack was a black community problem and then the opioid epidemic occurred, failure to address the issue in one community left us unprepared when a similar issue arose in other communities. So I would say I think that our policy responses are highly sort of like very, very, very different in different contexts, right? That it when we consider the problem a problem of Black youth in cities who are lower income, that we approach, we have historically anyway approached it as a, an issue for further criminalization and further incarceration and sort of further surveillance. And that's the approach to deal with, right? I think, um, and that we have assumed, and I, I still get this when I start my research where people are like, oh, well, rural youth are just hunting. That's what's happening. And I'm like, I don't know many people who hunt with handguns. Um, and um, and it's not clear to me that that's what's going on, like that, that, that it's just rural youth hunt and, you know, black youth are dangerous. Like that, that sort of t narrative is very pervasive. Um, and it's subtly pervasive in the research that is out there as well, I would say. Um, so that's part of, I do think that there's some real um, hypocrisies about it. I don't know that it was like a problem in rural areas that then sort of crept up into urban areas. Like, I think that there's, there are different norms around carriage and there are different reasons young people might carry. So the rural youth in the studies they've done on rural youth report very positive norms around handgun carriage among their peers um, and among their families. So there is a very different norm around carriage. And I think, you know, certainly from a criminal justice perspective, there's a real double standard in how we handle, you know, kid carriage um, and, and how we, you know, make stories about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. There are a number of questions around the why of why young people carry guns as well as some of the messaging. So I'm gonna to try to get to a few of those because I think that we'll get at some of the themes that we're seeing in the chat. Um, we may not get to every specific question, but I think this will get at a lot of what folks were wondering about. So we can touch on that bef before we finish our meeting for the evening. Uh, but first would be, why, did you ask why young people carry guns? And is there any message that the gun does not make you safer that you think would change behavior, which is a conversation we have all the time. Guns do not make us safer, but the marketing messages are that guns do you know, equal safety. So if you can touch on the why and also that messaging piece and whether you think that would be effective. I, I, so I was relying on a survey that has been collected for a long time. And so I didn't get to decide on the questions. And I really, really wish they had said just why, like some basic why, even if it was a multiple choice answer, here are some whys. So they didn't ask in this study. Um, the study I just mentioned about rural youth, they are asking why. And in some of the studies around um, that are based in emergency room departments in cities, because there's a lot of studies like that, they also ask why. Um, and you get different whys. <laughs> um, so safety is consistent and you do see safety reported across a number of different contexts. Um, but safety, that sense of safety, but whether it's, I think, you know, we could logically point out why that's not true, but they believe that it will make them safer. Um, and there's certainly a lot of research saying, no, it doesn't make you safer. Um, but, you know, as you all have talked about, there's a lot of marketing telling people it will make you safer. And there's also, you know, whatever people's, you know, own pre-existing beliefs about whether it will make them safer. Um, so that's a big why. Um, and that's why I sort of keep talking about like norms around carriage and it's both your peer norms. So like, are your friends caring, but it's also your parent norms. Um, so if your family member um, has carried guns, then you're more likely to carry guns as well. Um, and that I think gets again at like these messages about like why. Um, there's some early research, newer research, it's more on adults, but around like issues of masculinity and um, how that's driving carriage for some groups of people. Um, but, but again, it's not teenager focused and I wanna focus us on teenagers because I think teenagers have their own thought processes that go on and we need to understand them better. Um, but the short answer is, I don't know. I wish they had asked why um, even, like or even 
some indication of like when or like there were there are many other questions I would have asked but they didn't ask them so and I, I also just want to sort of touch on safety as a concept and what that means and I saw something in the chat about this as well um, you know, one of the things that I think about, um, and we did a program with CFJJ a while back with some research from the Center for Port Innovation about why young people in that community in New York were mm -hmm. carrying guns. And so much yes. of it was about not feeling safe and not feeling like the systems that are supposed to keep them safe would keep them safe. And so right. one of the things that Nyoka and I talked about when we were debriefing this and preparing uh, for, for this meeting tonight was, how do we better get at the reasons why young people don't feel safe? And what do us adults in the room need to do to address that? Because if our young people don't feel safe, there's just some bigger issues that we really need to attend to. So just wanted to put that out there in this conversation as well. Um, and just a couple of final things before we tie this up. Um, I'm wondering if the study asked, or someone was wondering if the study asked how students obtained the handguns. And there was also a piece about how many of them may have had parents who were gun owners themselves, which I think you might've touched on briefly, but if you, if you can speak to that a bit. So this particular study didn't ask how, and it didn't ask about parents. That's why I said this, the data is, is limited when you're talking about sort of current national data. Um, there is a big push among people who do research around guns to get more national data. So for a while, the CDC and others were shut down in terms of funding. That funding ban has been lifted, but there's still kind of a lag in research. Um, it's still like, there's some newer projects that are starting, but there is um, we're still lacking national, really good national research that gets into sort of some of these real issues about what's actually driving people sort of their own perceptions or the, their context that they live in, things like that. Um, so that's, that's, I wish they had asked. Um, I do, um, and I, I think that that's like on the parent thing, um, I don't know. I mean, I do think probably kids get guns both from, you know, friends and from parents. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is it just asked, have you carried a gun in the last year? So it could be like, I carried a gun and I was intending to commit a crime, or it could be like, somebody, you know, my cousin showed me a gun and I held it. Like there was very little definition of carriage or my parents take me to the shooting range every weekend. And so I carry, you know, that was carriage. Like we don't know even how young people interpreted the question. Um, but, um, but that's unfortunately true of a lot of the gun research out there. All right, thank you for that. And I actually wanna end with one last question, which is the last question I see in the chat. You talked about how there had been all these barriers to federal uh, funding for research. And now that the barriers have been lifted, but getting at Mark's question, is there more funding showing up for gun violence research? Because I think what we're hearing from you is your research brings up so many more questions that we all wanna have answered. So what's, what's the future hold in terms of research for this? So there is, I will say in the last, I mean, since the, um, sort of the Biden administration has put out a bunch of um, requests for research proposals to fund research. Um, they're particularly interested in um, programs that address gun violence, so that are sort of intervention focused. So not just, you know, what we're doing or what we did is very descriptive and not as much about, it's sort of just like, this is what we see is happening. I'm not, I wasn't an evaluation study or looking at what works. It was just like, we wanna tell you what's going on. Um, to start with, but they are really interested, I think, in funding programs and funding evaluations of programs and funding research about what works. Um, so I do think there's um, some definite prospects for doing much, much better. And I'm hopeful that they will also fund more of these basic questions about not just what brings the numbers down, but why are young people caring so we can start to get at sort of these underlying issues um, where they exist and think about, you know, where, if it is about safety, where are those safety messages coming from? So. Amazing. Thank you. And just, you know, thank you for being with us this evening, for sharing your wisdom with us, but also just thank you for all of this work that you're doing. It's so important that we understand these issues. Again, if we're going to make good policies and good practices, and you're a big part of helping us understand 
So I just want to appreciate you and all of the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm happy. Um, you're welcome to email me too. Um, I'll make sure Ruth has my contact information. But if I didn't answer your question, and I apologize, I wish the research was more. I wish there was, it was better and I could answer all your questions, but it's, it is what it is. So. It, but it, it's so incredibly helpful and it, it starts some really important conversations and hopefully it will spark yet more research and yet more inquiries so that we can better understand these issues and we can better intervene with young people so they can be safe in the world. So thank you for all that you are doing. Thank you. Just a couple of other things before we end for the evening. Um, we've been talking a lot about September being Suicide Aware Prevention Awareness Month. Um, and as we close out September and look ahead to October, which will be here before we know it, I also want to acknowledge that October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is something uh, that I think about a lot. I was an advocate for survivors of domestic and sexual violence for many years prior to coming to this work. And domestic violence work is gun violence work and gun violence work is domestic violence work. Um, and we will be talking a lot more about the intersection of guns and domestic violence I know Emily and Stephanie have been hard at work of putting some materials together that we'll be getting out to folks. There are also so many activities happening around Massachusetts for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. If folks are interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to go to the website of our friends at Jane Doe uh, to learn more about some of the events and activities happening around Massachusetts communities to acknowledge Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to mention as we look ahead to the next legislative session, um, and Janet teased this when she talked about the work that we did in response to the Bruin decision, is that we got a promise from our leaders at the State House that some of the other bills that we care very much about, such as crime gun data analysis, such as addressing ghost guns, would be taken up in an omnibus gun bill to be introduced at the beginning of the next legislative session. And when we got that promise, the first thing that we said over at the coalition is, okay, we will hold them to that. So we have been hard at work at putting together some thoughts about what we, we would like to see in that bill, collaborating with many of our national partners as well um, to really put something together where we can all uh, be saying to our state leaders, these are the things that we wanna see happen in Massachusetts to continue to strengthen our laws and ensure that folks are safer from gun violence. We will need all of your help when we get to the next legislative session to raise awareness, to be talking to legislators and to be doing, as I like to call it, banging our pots in front of the state house to make sure that folks are hearing us and knowing that we care about these issues and we want to see these bills get passed. So if you're not already on our email distribution list, um, you should be if you're here at this meeting and we'll make sure to, to get you on the list so you can get our action alerts and our updates when we're ready to start engaging in that advocacy because it will take all of us, our coalition community to make this happen. Um, and before we end, I just want to uh, thank all of you for being here with us this evening on this beautiful fall evening and taking time to be in this conversation. Thank you again to Nyoka Carey for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of you at Peace MVP in a few short weeks. If you have, and we will be sending out the recording from this meeting too. So look for that email and feel free to share it with others that you think might be interested. As always, if you have any questions, any concerns, please get in touch with us. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a great evening. <laughs>